Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast brought to you by the Houston Law Review about legal issues, prominent lawyers, and the study and practice of law. I'm Harrison Little. And I'm Jake Garino, and we are hosts for Season 5. Thank you for joining us. We're joined here today by two classmates of mine, Rachel Howard and Frank Chambers, who are Board 61 members of the Houston Law Review. Rachel is going to be talking about her experience clerking or applying for a clerkship with Judge Edith Jones at the Fifth Circuit, and Frank will be talking about his application and future role as a clerk for Judge Jeffrey Brown of the Southern District of Texas. But before we get started, you may have noticed that there's somebody different sitting next to me today. Today, I'm passing the torch to Jeffrey Okolo, who is one half of the dynamic duo taking over Emphasis Added next year as a podcast editor for the Houston Law Review. His co-host, Grayson Meckler, will make an appearance as soon as Harrison and I wrap up our duties uh, on the podcast, and we are super, super excited to have them on the show. Both of them are very talented, rising 3L students at U of H, and we cannot see how they incorporate their preferences and interests into the content they produce going forward. So, Jeffrey, want to introduce yourself? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. My name is Jeffrey Okolo. I'm a rising 3L here at UHLC. Um, I summered at Holland and Knight in their litigation department, and I hope to practice um, corporate litigation, well, not corporate, commercial litigation in the future. Um, very, very grateful for the opportunity to have the opportunity to build on what both Jake and Harrison have done with Emphasis Added, and I can't wait to learn along with the audience. Well said. So today we're going to be talking about the federal clerkships and what they imply after graduation. We're gonna discuss their personal motiv motivations for applying for them. We're gonna highlight the benefits they give your professional practice. We'll walk through the peaks and valleys of the application process, and as well as, you know, hopefully get some gems from what they've learned along the way. Thank you for joining us, guys. Thanks for, Thanks for having, having us. us. Well, I guess to start off for people who might not know what clerking is, um, what is clerking and what are like the general responsibilities and the time commitment that kind of comes with that role? Uh, Frank, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, clerking is basically you're sort of the hands and feet of the judge. Um, when uh, motions come in, you're the first person generally to deal with that. You write initial drafts, you uh, participating in the editing process with the judge. If there's hearings and trials, the clerk that's tasked to that particular cause of action will sit on those uh, and take notes, and uh, that depends on the judge's preference. So you function however the judge needs you to function, um, and I think specifically I'm addressing kind of what a district court judge does, uh, or what a district court clerk does. Um, Rachel could probably talk a little bit more about what that looks like on the appellate level. Um, yeah, I mean, same idea as on a district court, le court level where you're um, working with the judge on, um, and instead of, you know, cases, it's on the appellate level. So um, you're, you know, reading briefs and then writing an opinion. Um, but it's also slightly different in that um, instead of trials, there's um, oral arguments that you would attend. And especially if you're uh, were tasked with that opinion. Um, and specifically, you know, for the Fifth Circuit, if you're not sitting, if the judge that you're working for isn't sitting in New Orleans, there's also some travel involved where um, you'll travel with that judge to um, New Orleans for an oral argument, especially if it's on bonk or something like that. Um, so that is a little bit different. But I mean, I think the general principle is that you're there for what the judge needs you to do. Um, and so that'll vary from judge to judge for sure. Now, is that a very like close relationship with the judge? It sounds like you spend a lot of time with them and you work intimately with, intimately with them on several different projects, like for a lot of your time. Can y'all talk about like what that relationship looks like? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, again, it I, I almost feel like a theme will be that it varies from judge to judge. Judges, you know, love to do their thing. They have chambers in the way that works for them. Um, and so I think it can be a close relationship where you're um, maybe going back and forth about a case or a specific issue in a case and um, you're really talking about things and processing things with the judge. Um, I think sometimes it can be a little bit more hands off and you're, um, you know, 
writing the first draft of something, send it to the judge. They va- they very formally send you back edits, and it kind of goes back and forth that way. So I think there's absolutely a spectrum there. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add. I think there's a spectrum outside of the work as well. Um, for uh, Judge Brown, who I'm going to, I know regarding the work, he doesn't like to give you his thoughts prior to you writing the first draft so that it's sort of uh, unvarnished um, based on what you find in the law. Um, And then after that, that's when you kick in the collaborative editing process. Um, Beyond that, I know uh, for Judge Brown's chambers, there's, you know, the clerks have their communal office. The judge has his communal office. There is mixing in between, but uh, it's two distinct offices. where uh, Rachel and I both interned with Judge Rosenthal, uh, the clerks there have their own independent offices, but as often as possible, the uh, Judge Rosenthal would eat lunch with the clerks. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, a communal relationship outside of the cases. Sometimes business was discussed during, during those lunches, but usually it's just like, how are you? How's, how are things? Um, so I think that's gonna vary from judge to judge based on their temperaments and personalities. Um, so it, it really, just depends on where you land. Uh, I guess so generally speaking, it's a first, the relationship with the judge differs from chamber to chamber and clerks have kind of a collaborative role with the judge in drafting things like opinions as well as in taking a different perspective on cases in front of them. It sounds like a good summary. I would say, um, just based off what you guys said, it sounds like it's very, um, it's, it's really cool opportunity, really, to be involved in such important matters and to have such adept legal minds um, really kind of mentoring you and guiding your own professional development. Um, is that one reason that led you guys to apply for a federal clerkship? I'll jump in first on this yeah. one. So uh, initially, I think my reasons for applying were ego-driven. Um, Starting law school, I knew that clerkships were a thing that very talented students got, and it was like another feather in your cap. Um, And when I interned during the fall of my 2L for Judge Rosenthal, um, I had just landed my 2L summer job, and so like I was feeling like I knew what I was going to do after graduation. I was going to go earn a paycheck. That was exciting. And so my excitement for a clerkship was sort of fading. But spending that semester in chambers with her two clerks and with her, it really revitalized my interest. First, I saw that this was an opportunity to really learn from the brightest legal minds out there, the judges. Um, Second, it gave you an opportunity to really hone your legal writing skills um, and to really, let's put it this way, enhance your BS meter when it came to what attorneys say in courtrooms and what they say in their briefing. Um, And so, The third reason, I think, was seeing the interaction between the clerks and the judge and what kind of relationship they created. For instance, Judge Rosenthal's 30th anniversary on the bench happened while I was there. And seeing the parade of former clerks come in and what their careers looked like, how she'd been involved, and what those relationships were like, uh, all of that really convinced me, like, this is something I do need to do, regardless of the prestige behind it. It's a learning experience. It's something that I will be able to carry with me through my entire career. So that's really what pushed me into it after I was sort of like fading on in, in my interest. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think Frank said it well. I, I came into law school knowing what a clerkship was. Mainly, like, I have one lawyer in my family, and it's my uncle, and we had, like, a Zoom meeting <laughs> just, like, the July before starting my 1L year. And he said that his like one regret of his career was that he didn't clerk for a judge. And so that made an impression on me. So I, in the back of my head, I said, okay, I know clerking's a thing. Um, and then during my 1L year, I knew I wanted to do a judicial internship, um, which is how I worked as an intern for Judge Rosenthal. Um, and so I worked with her clerks and I loved it. I mean, as an intern, you're kind of like a baby clerk in a way where, I mean, it's, the hierarchy is kind of like the judge gives the clerks work and the clerks give you work. Um, and I loved what I was doing. And so that kind of solidified my interest that this was something that I wanted to do. And even outside of that, I 
think I totally saw the value for my career in that you're working for a court and if you're working in litigation like you're kind of on the other side of things and I think that's valuable knowledge to carry with you everyone talks about how um, working for a judge heavily improves your writing um, I love writing I love that aspect of litigation so that was absolutely something I wanted to do um, and I I was definitely attracted to the mentorship aspect um, and just learning from someone who had you know been on the bench for likely a long time and had a career before that um, they have a lot of wisdom both career-wise and outside of that um, and like I've seen the value of mentorship as I've been a law student too and so that was definitely something that I was excited about um, as far as what a clerkship could give me well it seems that again clerkships carry both professional as well as like personal benefits um, so we'd like to ask you all how competitive was the clerkship process as well as kind of get to the nitty-gritty of what the clerkship application process looked like yeah um maybe frank can start i think that makes yeah, sense yeah so my my process was a little more conventional um where uh, rachel had a little different path uh, they're very competitive to get a clerkship. Um, pretty much when you start entertaining the idea, anybody you ask for advice will tell you to cast a wide net because there's numerous people applying to every single judge uh, and you know maybe something on your resume or in your writing sample or cover letter will stand out to one judge where it doesn't stand out to the other 300 that you apply to. Um, and so that wide net is important. Um, now, however, that being said, I didn't cast a wide net. I am sort of geographically bound as a second career student. I'm, I'm old um, and I uprooted a little bit to come to law school uh, and I couldn't ask my spouse to like move to a random place in a random state. Mm -hmm. So we looked entirely in the Southern District of Texas, particularly the Houston Division and the Galveston Division because it's only roughly an hour drive away. Um, and so I applied both on Oscar and to judges who received applications off of Oscar. Um, and that varies. You can use Oscar for those application requirements. It depends on the judge. Some it's a mystery. You have to contact their legal assistants to find out what their process is. But others who don't accept Oscar applications put their application requirements on Oscar. Um, and then the mystery is like, well, are they hiring for this term? Are they hiring for 2030? Mm -hmm. Like, you never know. Um, so I did both. Uh, and the clerkship that I ended up landing was one that sought applications both off and on Oscar. They used, uh, Judge Brown uses both. Um, and so I uh, interviewed with him. I also interviewed with a judge who entirely uses the Oscar process. Um, and so Oscar makes it very streamlined. Uh, and even if you're applying to judges that are not on Oscar, the, still the requirements are about the same. It's usually two or three letters of recommendation, your transcripts, maybe your undergrad transcript, a writing sample, maybe two writing samples, um, and a cover letter. Uh, it doesn't go very far beyond that. Some judges may have some like obscure requirements, but that's pretty much what you're looking at. It's interesting because I wasn't led to believe, you know, I, I didn't really look into the federal clerkship process beyond thinking about it and thinking it was cool. Um, for transparency's sake. Uh, but I was led to believe that like, if you want a federal clerkship, you need to go through Oscar and that they'll, that's the only place they'll be. And, you know, I, I understood that there were also direct application, you know, avenues, but I'm kind of surprised to hear that it wasn't as like broadly encompassing, you know, this is where like kind of like a job panel, like LinkedIn or Simplicity or something like that where you're thinking, okay, this is where I go find a job. This is where I, you know, these, this portal exists for a reason to kind of like streamline the process, like you said. Um, but Rachel, you have a very interesting uh, path to your clerkship. Tell us yeah, a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, speaking to the competitiveness, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's generally known to be competitive. Um, and my clerkship that I'll be doing is with the fifth circuit so it's on the circuit level which I thought I don't know it was just like not in the cards if you go to a school that's like ranked lower than like 20 or something I don't like that was a completely arbitrary number but that was kind of the understanding I had so even going into like processing like where am I going to send applications to um I initially didn't even 
like wasn't even going to apply to the fifth circuit. Um, that was a, like maybe like two weeks. Maybe I, um, I actually like made the decision. Okay, no, I'll just go for it. Like might as well, you know, um, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Uh, you just won't, won't get a fifth circuit job and that's okay. Um, but yeah, you're right. My process was definitely unconventional in that it was totally conventional. I, in that I got my letters of recommendation, I got all my application materials, that kind of stuff. Um, but I, um, am like, I guess regularly meet with a professor here. Um, and she's great. I've like taken two classes with two classes with her. I've TA'd for her. Um, just generally keep up with her because I like her as a person and um, I would definitely consider her a mentor for me. But it's like the week of my applications that I'm about to send out and I am meeting with her and she clerked for Judge Jones and she said, oh, I'm getting lunch with her this week. Would you like me to mention you? I said, absolutely. Yes, please mention me. Um, and so... And then she got back to me and said, Judge, would love to see your resume, which was, um, like, the best result that could have happened. Um, and so I sent um, Judge Jones my resume. And from looking at my resume, she offered me an interview. So to clarify, like, that absolutely short-circuited the application process, and I didn't send out any other applications to any other judges. So you skipped all the red tape, essentially. Yeah, basically, because I – like I was informed that I got an interview that was kind of a short process I had like less than a week to prepare and then interviewed and then it was less than a week and I got the job and so obviously if I hadn't I would have yeah sent out all the, all my applications like I had planned um but luckily that didn't happen um but yeah and also to kind of connect to what Frank was saying I too did not cast a wide net in that I am married with a husband who has a job here um that couldn't we couldn't uproot to another state so i um only looked in the southern district of texas only in houston not even in galveston i was kind of stubborn about that um and so it yeah so i think that almost makes it a lot more competitive so i mean you have a very small pool of judges that you could possibly interview for and like you um so, yeah, that kind of made it a little bit more daunting. It's understandable that it was daunting as, again, if you're only limiting your um, search to the Southern District of Texas, it definitely limits the amount of judges you can apply to. Um, but you did mention that you couldn't, I guess, cast a broader net, much like Frank, because of other considerations. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask, like, could you highlight the differences between – um, applying for the district courts and how that differs from the appeals courts. Do you want me to take this one since I? Yeah. Since you're the unicorn in the room. Um, <laughs> uh, so the the application process is generally the same. The only difference probably is going to be what writing sample you send. Mm-hmm. Um, the district court judge is looking for some sort of memo, uh, a brief if you have one on the district court level. The appellate uh, courts are looking for something that's a little bit more appellate uh, writing. So if you've written an appellate brief for legal writing class or if you took appellate advocacy at your school um, or if you have worked in an appellate capacity, I had the opportunity to work for the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in their appellate division my 1L summer and so I had a brief uh, to the Fifth Circuit that I had written and so I utilized that for my uh, my Fifth Circuit application. So that's about the only difference. What what writing sample did you use for district court applications? Uh, because I had the opportunity to write uh, an order for motion for summary judgment with Judge Rosenthal, mm-hmm. um, I utilized that. Now, of course, you need to send things that are entirely your work. So if you've gone through the editing process with a, a clerk or with somebody else, um, you need to try to like come back to one of your earlier versions and then work forward from that. Uh, so it is your your entire work. So on both of those, I, I there was editing on on the one that I submitted to district courts, but mm-hmm. I I walked it back to like my earliest version and then cleaned it up based on where I was at that point uh, as a legal writer. Yeah, I actually submitted the student note that I wrote for a law review. Really? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was a difference. And I and I knew that was, um, I guess, particularly, that's definitely more of like on an appellate level thing. Because that's, yeah. I mean, it's good because it is entirely your own work. <laughs> um, also at that point, like it hadn't gone through the grueling editing process of all of the editors on Law Review. Um, so it was, you know, unapologetically my thing. Um, but, you know, it's long. So you can, you know, cut it and maybe like cut it to like 10 pages and just include that. I included the whole thing because I was like, they can read what they want. It's okay. (laughs) The advice I had received on on that part Mm -hmm. is like, uh, if you're submitting um, a legal memo or something, like give seven pages, Mm -hmm. but then also attach the entire thing. And at the end, include a note that says like, in the event that you would like to continue reading, I have also included the full. See exhibit A. Yeah. (laughs) Would you suggest that someone who doesn't have the law review experience or the opportunity to submit their their journal note, for example, or their work product from the appellate division, um, would like a you know motion for summary judgment in like a one L writing class or like someone who's because would a motion for summary judgment or some sort of other work product that you've gone through the writing process but you don't have necessarily the journal experience and you don't have any some anything that's necessarily substantive that meets those like very strict requirements would that work or would it be more of like a project oriented if you want to go and get these clerkships you really need to kind of focus on finding opportunities to produce something that's more professional in scope I mean I would say ideally you submit something that's out of your 1L year um, because hopefully your writing has grown a lot um, and you know, and hopefully that maybe came out of a summer internship after your 1L year or some kind of class that you took that was writing-based or something like that. So you definitely don't, you know, need to have a student note to submit a solid writing sample out of 1L year. Um, but, you know, you need to have kind of those writing opportunities that come from a lot of different ways. But um, just, you know, after your 1L year, that's ideal. You definitely can. Um, but, yeah, it's maybe not the best thing ever yeah I think as long as you have something that shows your writing quality and your ability to apply the law to some sort of factual scenario um, that shows that you can do the work that you're required to do at, in a clerkship um, I will say the only thing about like you using 1L stuff would be that because there are judges that you can apply to after your first semester um, mm, like true like, yes, you can use that in those scenarios, but yeah, I would 100% agree with Rachel on, if you're applying to somebody on Oscar, which is June after your 2L, um, or if you're applying some somebody during the springtime of 2L, yeah, use something that you produced a little bit later. Yeah, and I mean, I was, whenever I interned for a firm this past summer, I was working with someone who just came out of his 1L year, and he was applying for clerkships already, which someone, like, usually you apply um like during 2L right after 2L so he was very early um and he uh got a clerkship but he was obviously had to use something from his 1L year um and that also clued me into the fact that okay judges really do hire far out and they're hiring um students earlier and earlier in law school too yeah two of the six litigation 2Ls I summered with came into our summer with clerkships Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of them had interned with a judge during her 2L year who then just at the end of the internship offered her uh, a amazing. clerkship. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Easiest way, right? Uh, and the other one, uh, the clerkship office told him, hey, there's a judge who's looking for a clerk. You need to apply um, during his 2L. And so that's how that worked. Um, so it is it is possible like uh, to not have to rely on the system either for those opportunities to arise. Mm-hmm. Um, if y'all don't mind me asking, what was the hardest part of the application process? Mm. I think figuring out who would be suitable to recommend you. Mm. Um, recommendations need to come if you're seeking one from a professor, from somebody who knows you well, which means you have to have been, uh, intentional about building a relationship starting early in law school. Mm -hmm. Um, So I 
sought recommendations from a professor I had had during uh, the first semester of 1L and then TA for. And then I also sought a recommendation from my legal writing professor who uh, I had had for the full year and was uh, a legal writing fellow under. So I'd had relationships beyond just what I did in their classes. Um, and then beyond that, finding a professional person to recommend you so it's not just all academics. Um, and I was uh, lucky enough and blessed enough to uh, be able to ask a judge for a recommendation. So that, that helps. But figuring that out early and being, if, you're, if you know that like I'm a 1L, I want a clerk, like who should I begin to build that relationship with for the purposes of recommendations? Yeah, that's hard. Was that Professor Salib? One uh, of them? Yes. Was one of them, yeah. Check out our artificial intelligence and First Amendment episode um, <laughs> that we produced, Harrison and I filmed earlier this year. Amazing. Um, what was the hardest part? I mean, I think that is definitely true, the recommenders. And also, you know, keeping up with your recommenders. There are busy professors, bu busy professionals that, you know, maybe you have to nudge with an email sometimes. Um, I think part of it, especially if you are an applicant that is casting a wide net, it's just a grueling process. You're applying to a lot of people. You're probably already jaded from applying f for like big law or all of these other things. Um, and so, I don't know, it's just, it's a lot to keep up with. And I think, um, yeah, I, th I think also one of the hard parts is just knowing when to apply because, uh, you know, we have this Oscar thing that streamlines the process maybe but a lot of judges don't use it a lot of them hire far out so are they hiring for 2026 by now by 2027 and so timing those applications can just be kind of frustrating you probably will have to have a spreadsheet at some point in this process I did have a spreadsheet yes. yeah <laughs> i mean i had a spreadsheet for my own like just summer associate applications yeah. i feel like i mean me too taking it so much seri more seriously when you're applying for like a position in the government i feel like is just crucial to keeping all of your uh eggs or all, all your priorities or information in a line so you don't accidentally send uh or mislabel a cover letter or something exactly. where so are these all very specific application materials that you're formulating for the judge you're applying to or is it like i mean like a cop not, not a cut and paste but like if you if you have a form cover letter and you're just kind of like moving in the, uh, you know, the name, who you're applying to, what you're doing, you know, what the term is, whatever. Um, or is it like more of a specific, tailored, I'm going to write this individually for Judge Jones, like kind of scenario? Yeah, I mean, I think things definitely differ if you're applying appellate versus district. Um, but, you know, maybe between judges... You would probably have to, you know, maybe you met them at a talk that they gave or and that's something that you would mention. Maybe maybe you've written multiple, maybe you have multiple writing samples to choose from and you know that they really love bankruptcy law and you wrote something about that or they really care about this constitutional law issue and you happen to write your student note about that. So maybe if you have multiple writing samples to choose from, you could tailor it to a specific judge. Um, but outside of that, I don't know. Yeah, like when it comes to cover letter stuff, I, I had sort of the chunk that stayed the same that was about me specifically. Um, and then my intro as to why the judge, why I was well suited to clerk in the judge's chambers and what connection I might have had to, to the judge uh, was flexible. And then same thing on like, you know, I have attached my blah, blah, blah application materials would change based on what the judge wanted. Um, mm -hmm. But the middle of it was mostly the same. Uh, and beyond that, like the tailoring wasn't really tremendous. Yeah, and maybe you would tailor your recommenders, maybe. Yeah. But, I mean, that's just kind of more work on you mm -hmm. that, you know, instead of having your three recommenders for everyone, you would get maybe another one for this specific judge. Yeah. I don't know. If there was a connection, for sure, that's, yeah. a, that's a way to go if you have that that leverage. Well, I mean, it seems like both of you did that because, I mean, you met, or you're clerking for a judge that was also, that was referred to, the judge you're working for was referred to you by the professor that you've done so well with. Mm -hmm. And 
you, one of your recommenders was a, another judge in was it Judge Rosenthal? It was. Okay, so then another federal another, judge another member of the federal district. southern district. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, interesting. So that that personal connection sounds like it's pretty, if not like very important, at least it definitely adds weight to your application. For sure, there's going to be so many applications that hit their inboxes or desks that if you have something that can set you apart from the rest, then use it, whatever it is. Um, one of the, I don't know if it was an advantage or not, that I had is there were U of H grads in Judge Brown's chambers uh, clerking, that, and I stayed in contact with them. Like, what did you put in your application? What writing samples did you send? What did... You know, uh, that kind of stuff. But also, once I had submitted an application, like, has he read it? <laughs> um, well, has he expressed any thoughts? Have the clerks read it? Like, where am I in the process? Like, keeping in touch that way, just so it was a way to just keep my, my finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. So if you have something, whether it's through your clerkship office or your uh, a professor you know or a, a personal contact that you might have, use those as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my professors did say like, hey, if you're gonna apply to this particular judge in this particular circuit, I will write you a glowing uh, recommendation. And I didn't uh, <laughs> because as I said, I didn't wanna move. But um, like knowing what those opportunities are is important as well. So like flesh them out, find out like, hey, you know, talk to your, your professors about clerking and yeah. who they would recommend you clerk for. Also U of H. Like the CDO puts out a list of the professors and if they've clerked, like who they clerked for and what circuit they clerked for. Okay. Yeah, so that is so if you know you're applying to the third circuit, you can you know talk to that professor and say, hey, tell me about it or you know that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, the CDO puts out resources for you to use connections that are you know already there. Yeah, UHLC has a clerkship packet. And at the end of it, it has a table with all of that. It also has a list of where people have gone to clerk and judges they've clerked with. Um, so you can use that. Mm -hmm. That's how I, I started to build my spreadsheet before deciding to just restrict it to the local area. Um, but I think at that point I had something like 50, 50 judges of, of places that I would be willing to live um, and, uh, and people who had some sort of connection to UHLC. Um, does the CDO also help with that process, connect you with um, alums who attended UHLC and who clerked, or is that like work you have to go do on your own time, tracking those people down? I didn't seek out help. I did it on my own, but I think that's that was my own choice. It wasn't because I felt like there wasn't an opportunity, so I can't really speak to whether or not they would help or not. I don't know. If... I, think, I think U of H has an alumni list for clerking. Um, so it'll tell, like, give you their name when they graduated. Um, I did go to the CDO. Um, I think I met, like, with Bill, Bill Powers twice. He's, like, the clerkship guy. Um, mostly just to figure out timing. <laughs> that was, like, really hard for me to figure out. If I want to work here, like, at this time, when do I apply for this? Like, you know, I've heard of other people that are already getting clerkships for two years out. So I don't know. That just really made me nervous. So they kind of, he helped me figure out, okay, when does it make sense for you <laughs> to apply? Um, so yeah, but I didn't necessarily seek out any um, like U of H alumni on my own to kind of like ask questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is probably just an assumption I'm making, but it seems like the system rewards those who take initiative as opposed to just being like, like if I want to ask you and apply for a clerkship for you, from either of you, I feel like y'all would appreciate it more if I made the direct connection as opposed to potentially having someone else, you know, coordinate that initial connection, particularly because like if you have a common denominator being UHLC, there's, while the CDO adds a certain you know, verification to like the official process and that you're good, you know, going through and doing the right things. That's also just something that you can also say in your own application materials where you say like, hey, look, you went to, you are a Law Review alum that is hiring for, you know, summer or the, for the 2025 year. Can, or I want to apply for that, you know, like it, it, making that connection yourself, I guess what I'm saying is more important than like kind of having a third party advocate on your behalf because it's more like, I don't know, 
has more gumption. I think that that well. I think it's true. The system rewards initiative. I think yeah, that's yeah. absolutely true. But I think it also helps that if you have somebody, a third party, who knows you and knows the judge that can vouch for you, mm -hmm. that's that greases the wheels, mm -hmm. um, for sure. I I can say that other people from other schools that I know who have clerkships, um, that those, like, they had people to vouch for them, even if they took the initiative. So I think your best bet is to, to have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With things like timing, um, organizing letters of recommendations, and all the other stuff that goes into the application process, is there anything y'all would like to know prior to starting the process? Um, or think that you know now that you wish you had known then? Hmm. I think the one thing everybody told me that I didn't quite do well enough didn't matter in the end <clears throat> was start early, like to get your recommenders lined up, to get your writing sample perfected. Um, if you're only applying through Oscar, you need to be starting in like December of 2L. Like if you're not starting in December 2L, you're gonna be frantic by the time you realize, oh my gosh, I need to do this. It's April, oh, but I have finals. Right. And then finals, oh, but then I'm starting my work and then it's June and you didn't do anything. <laughs> So, um, yeah. just thinking about the context of what your life was going to look like during that, that spring semester during 2L. Um, and then if you're applying to people off, off, off the Oscar plan, then it just depends on, on their schedules. So, for me, because I didn't cast a wide net, um, I didn't have the problem of scope and trying to tailor, you know, 300 cover letters to judges, uh, it was, it was time consuming enough to do however many I actually did apply to. But um, yeah, start early and so that you're not cramped in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think I absolutely echo that sentiment. I mean, I made the intentional choice that I didn't wanna work right after school. I wanted a year at the firm that I would be working at and then I would go and clerk. So that let me chill a little bit more um, than other people. So I didn't have to uh, put all this together during my 2L year, which is just a crazy year for everyone. Um, so, but it was still a lot. And yeah, and it's hard because in order to have time, you need to have foresight that clerking is something you want to do. And I think that's hard when, you know, you don't go into law school, maybe even knowing what it was. And maybe you don't even know if you want to do transaction or litigation. And that is something that plays into whether you want to clerk or not. And so I think that's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to balance is uh, you really have to have foresight um, that you want to clerk for, you know, keeping up your grades and getting application materials together and forming relationships with professors and all of the things that go. So the process starts so early, even, you know, way before you start putting together application materials. I will add one one thing to that. It's becoming more common to work for a little while before you even apply for clerkships. Um, it used to be not taboo, but just like it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But more and more judges are looking for people who have work experience before hiring them because you, you don't have to train them how to be an attorney at the same time as they're clerking for you. Mm -hmm. They already understand kind of what's, what it looks like to be uh, an attorney and practice and write. Um, so you've they've been trained on somebody else's dime. So if if you're in a process where you're like, I really don't know, but it's it's interesting and, and you don't want to jump into it now, you can jump into it later. One of the, mm -hmm. the people that I worked with this summer uh, at my job, he was a second year associate who was leaving when we all left uh, to go clerk for a year. And then and that was his plan. It wasn't that he, uh, he busted out and didn't get a clerkship during his, his school. Um, he just didn't want to. Yeah, so. and people also apply when they're not even law students. Like they apply in their first year of work and they mm -hmm. get a clerkship and go clerk. Um, so you can totally avoid all of this mess, you know, just like do well in school. And then you don't even have to, you know, put all of this effort into putting together application materials while you're doing classes and all of this other stuff. 
you can wait for when you're working. You know, maybe working is crazy for you too. I mean, we're lawyers, but so I don't know. Maybe that's a risk. Um, but that's also possible. You don't, you know, it's not the end of the road if you don't apply to clerk and you've graduated. You can still apply for sure. Is that avenue still available like three, four, five years after you've graduated law school? Or is there like a hard cutoff where it's like maybe the first year, the second year, you should probably apply for your clerkship rather than waiting until you're done 10 years of practice? There's probably an unspoken cutoff. I don't know what that would be. Anything I would say would be like a guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am aware of one person who clerked after practicing five years um and they clerked as a means to pivot into academia um i do know people who have used clerking after three or four years to pivot out of a firm that they weren't in ha they weren't happy with and like give them an, a buffer in between to then go to a different firm um so i don't think it i don't think it there's a, a time limit that's just arbitrarily stamped. But yeah, like Rachel, I would just be guessing. And I think some of that might be dependent on your judge as well, mm -hmm. uh, what they prefer to have. If they're a judge that wants to really mold young minds, then you probably don't have a chance. But again, that's <laughs> like applying for a clerkship is like knowing who you're applying to mm -hmm. and knowing what they're looking for. Probably but not partners from firms, right? Uh, probably not. I, ima <laughs> I imagine if you're yeah. a partner at a firm, you're probably not looking for that added resume buff. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah. Okay. I'm curious how you prepared for your interviews. It's like you, okay, I have the interview. Mm -hmm. What am I doing to prep? So I had two interviews uh, for Judge Brown. I talked to uh, both. Tiffany Penner and Andrew Jacobs, who are Law Review alum. Uh, Tiffany was clerking with him at that time, and Andrew was about to clerk with him, uh, clerking with him right now, um, to find out what their interviews were like. If there were any areas to kind of like not go into, any questions to avoid, things that they felt like were, uh, you know, home run questions that they asked, or things that, you know, you never know if the judge is going to ask you, like, all right, uh, you know, tell me what you think about. Uh, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Like, oh you never know. Yeah. I did hear on a podcast once that there was a, somebody who was uh, interviewing with a, a, a circuit court judge, and it was like, list your top five cases and mm. their holdings. <laughs> like, so you never know. You So always, when you're preparing for an interview, talk to people who have clerked for them and have interviewed with them in the past, so there's no surprises. Um, another one, this is not my situation, but on that same podcast, it was like, uh, tell me five books that you've read recently. Like, so like being able to just like riffle through your brain and in the moment when you're like, oh my gosh, what have I read? Uh, might be paralyzing, but if you're able to have that knowledge uh, ahead of time. Uh, for Judge Ho, uh, I interviewed with Yvonne Ho, uh, who's a magistrate here in the Southern District of Texas. Um, she had only been on the bench for, at that point, not even a year. Mm. And so uh, I didn't have much to go on. Um, I talked to some people who were familiar with her. Um, and I read like uh, maybe a brief or two she had written as an appellate practitioner, but like that was the extent of what I was able to do. I knew she was a classically trained pianist, so I could always talk about music because I'm a musician as well. Um, so I knew there were things I could always like fall back on. Mm -hmm. um, but again, even that is like know who you're interviewing with and know about them a little bit. How did you prepare for yours? Um, yeah, it was a quick turnaround. I think it was like less than a week. And well, I knew, so I mean, I was interviewing for a circuit level clerkship. Um, so maybe things would be more intense. I don't know. Um, and, you know, I talked obviously to the professor that, you know, kind of established that connection because um, she clerked for her. But I mean, she did clerk for her. I don't. I don't know, at least like over 20 years ago. So I did I talk to anyone that had clerked for her in the past five years? No, that would that would have totally been a good decision on my part. I did not, though, which, you know, obviously I got the job, so it was OK. But um, I prepped by one. I like went on Westlaw to like their litigation analytics <laughs> and looked at cases that 
um, were big cases of hers that were maybe well known or something like that. Um, and just familiarize myself with maybe one or two that I could bring up in a conversation. And then with recent ones. Um, so recent and big cases I kind of familiarize myself with. And then I, um, she's been on the bench for a long time and she's like, you know, spoken at different things. And so I kind of watched some stuff that she had, um, spoken at and just, just to kind of catch her vibe. What did she care about? What was she like? Um, and then I also knew that there was a chance that there would be substantive questions. So I made sure to know what was like my favorite Supreme Court case, favorite Supreme Court justice, who did I not like, my least favorite Supreme Court case, what I especially made sure to know what were the big things that were happening in the Supreme Court term right now. Um, and so I, and, and then I made sure to know my resume really well. I mean, you can, that's for any job ever, but um, know my resume really well and know the, my writing sample really well. Um, I think that's all I did. It was a lot. I didn't do any school that week, oh. really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was behind in my classes after that week. And so I was like, I really hope I get this job because otherwise that was not worth it. You had to prepare like that for every interview you ever did, yeah. I Yes, and I just did one. And I was like, this is such a grueling process. Can if, you imagine for people who like cast wide nets? Yeah, they have to travel and like all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a reality. It mm -hmm. absolutely is. So, yeah, that's how I prepped. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope our listeners have gotten a lot of really good nuggets because I've learned a lot as well. Um, Joffrey, Jeffrey, Mr. Man, <laughs> I'm excited for you to take this over next year, oh. and you're going to do great. Really good luck. Okay. I'm excited to do that as well. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Emphasis Added is a podcast brought to you by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you see, Check us out on Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast streaming app for new content when it drops. Follow us on Instagram at Emphasis Added Pod, or check out the law review at HoustonLawReview.org.